afternoon, everybody. I must say I feel quite intimidated because A, I'm not an historian and B, a lot of old Campbellians in the room, so I will try my best to get all my facts correct. Um, thank you very much for your time and your interest in this project. I have to say it's been a fantastic thing for us to work on and for me personally I have really, really enjoyed the journey. I'm going to try and work a bit of technology, so forgive me, I might have to call on people to help me because I thought I'd like to show you a little animation to get us started which came out of the project and it might help set the scene. So I'm now going to try and negotiate my way through the website. It may not be as easy as it looks. If there's a technical person on hand to assist, that would be great. Here we go. Just need to get into our story. So I wanted to show you, this was an animation that um, really was an end result of the project and will be part of our teacher resource pack that we are now endorsed by SIA to share with all the schools in Northern Ireland. Um, if we go down to stories. College's Great Hall are photographs of past pupils and teachers who have fought in conflicts across the world. These men behind the glass include 127 old Campbellians who fought and died in the First World War. As well as learning in the classroom, many Campbell boys excelled at sports like rugby and cricket. When the war began in 1914, teachers and former pupils were quick to answer the call embodying the school's ethos of creating men of character. During the four-year conflict, the 127 men behind the glass played their part as soldiers, sailors, medics, chaplains, stretcher bearers, as aviators. On land, at sea, in the desert, in the air, in the trenches of the Western Front, fighting at famous battles such as Gallipoli, the Somme, and Ypres, and winning many medals for bravery, including a Victoria Cross. 127 men behind the glass who made the ultimate sacrifice. These are their stories. Campbell College, their school. So I don't know if you recognise the voice on that voiceover. It is an old Campbellian, David Caves, who's silent witness. Um, and David was very, very keen to work with us on the project. And we were very keen that this was involving our old boys as much as it was the current pupils. So just a bit of background as to how this all started. As I say, I'm a development director at Campbell. I'm not the historian. Unfortunately, he couldn't be here today, but it was myself that drove the project forward. But I'm, as I say, I did a history A level, but that was as far as it went. Um, it really was born out of a need. Um, I have to say it was our old Campbellian community who were looking at the photographs and realized that they were getting damaged. Uh, I don't know if any of you have been to the Central Hall and Campbell College. It's a huge, big, old building. There's water damage coming through. And some of these pictures were starting to show signs of fading, but also damage. They were concerned that, you know, having sat in the walls for 90 years, that in another 90 years they might not be there. And they flagged it with us and wanted to fix it. So we talked to Peroni. The first conversation we had was with Peroni, um, with Lorraine Burke, to say, how do we go about this? Because we knew we couldn't just pull these photographs out of their frames and put them back up again. 
uh, it was going to be much more complicated than that. And we realised the responsibility we had not to, to get this wrong um, and not to do any damage to those photographs. Crony, I have to say from the very beginning, incredibly helpful. And thank you again for all your help because you guided us from the very start as what not to do and what to do so that we got it right. So it was born out of being a preservation um, project to start with and a conservation project. But it grew very quickly to being much more than that because we recognised within the college that we would spent years looking at these photographs and all of you who are in this room who have been to the college will remember having assemblies in the hall and seeing these pictures of these men around the walls. And the pictures of the men have their face and the date that they died. So we felt it was time to celebrate their lives rather than just remembering their deaths. And that was really the, the nub of the idea of where this project was going to grow from just being about conserving photographs to actually respecting these men for what they did when they were alive as much as respecting them for what they sacrificed. And so it began. We, we approached Heritage Lottery to, to have funding for this and grateful for their support because none of it would have happened without that. Just a wee bit of context for Campbell today because it might be useful for those of you who don't know. Um, Campbell sits in East Belfast. We're 125 years old this year. Um, 1894 was founded by Henry James Campbell. Um, as a school for liberal education for, for boys. It's an all-boys school, age 3 to 18. We have 150 boarders from 30 different countries around the world. It's always been a boarding school as well as a day school. It's very much an international uh, cohort of pupils, which has been an important part of this project as well, because one thing we wanted to look at was the war from all sides and from all angles, and that was very important to us. As I say, it started with the photographs. Um, it really was about preserving them to start with and making sure we could have them in perpetuity in the walls. But a very big part of it was about access and about involving everybody in this process. This gentleman is Desi, who's our maintenance guy. And Desi, we discovered, has a real passion for history and has always talked about the photographs on the walls and was very excited to get involved, as was our <coughs> security guard and our other groundskeepers. So it was very much about involving our own staff in the process as well as about involving the rest of the community. I would say with Campbell we recognise the fact that there are perceptions of the college of being behind big gates. And that's always been something because we're a slightly different school to many schools in Northern Ireland. We are a fee paying, part fee paying school. So part of the, the drive for this from the Board of Governors and from the senior team was this is about opening up access to the college. This was about sharing the stories of these men but also really opening up those gates and opening up our archives and allowing as many people in to use and benefit from them as possible. So that was very much the drive. It was about, it was about access and opening up the archives. So when we sat and looked about how we do this, that was the driver for all of us. Website, you've seen me try to navigate my own website. It's quite easy if you've been on, have a look. That's your starting point for getting information out there. The historian we worked with was Dr. Tom Thorpe who had a passion for World War I um, and came to us with high recommendations. And I have to say, I'm sorry he's not here because he's done an incredible job on gathering the information. We had a very, very good archive from a previous historian at school, Keith Haynes, and Keith's fantastic job that he had done to get things in a really good place. So we had a very good starting point for all that we needed. Um, and with great respect to Keith, it was fantastic to have that. And what Tom did was then take those stories and build them into a website, make them accessible. So the website was very much about sharing as many stories as we could. So all 126 men are featured on that website, each has their own story to tell and any links to anything that relates to them is, is there. As you can see that's just an example of how it looks and how I want. But do, I mean hopefully you've been on it, but do go and have a look and, and scroll through the different stories that are there to tell. Social media, I hate to say we live in this era with the young people, it's all about social media and if it's not photographed on social media it hasn't happened. So we recognised that we needed to, to get young people engaged. That's one of our key things was making sure what we did was relevant to the younger people from age three and up. So social media was a big driver for us and creating stories that were actually interesting and relevant for them to read and it has proven very popular. Talking about making it relevant, um, story I was telling earlier to somebody. Our rugby team this year got to the final of Schools Cup and last year we were in the semi-final and last year we pulled our rugby first 15 together and we said right we want you to recreate a photograph 
uh, a photograph from 1914 uh, of a rugby team, same as you, same age as you, who were setting off to play a big match. Um, and we gathered them on the steps, and there was a lot of banter and laughter and jokes and chat, you know, and I was trying to get them to sit down and be quiet. We sat them down, and then we handed each of them the photographs that you can maybe see in the image um, on the left here, these photographs. And those photographs all represent players from 1914 who didn't make it back from the war. And they're in exactly the same photographic position of these boys. Now, we've handed the photographs to the boys, explained what was happening, and you could hear the tone drop as they sort of realised, the realisation that that was them, you know, that was them a hundred years ago. And they started, some, there was a silence, and I've never heard the rugby team be silent before or after, um, but there was a moment of silence when they respected that these boys had sat in that very spot. I have to say that was quite an emotional moment for all of us, because we'd made it relevant to them, and that was a really big driver for us. Then the key was how do we, how do we take this history that's quite heavy and it's quite detailed and we take it to kids who are P5, P6 and make it land with them. And I have to say this is where Living Legacies were fantastic, Living Legacies at Queen's um, brought drama. We brought drama is the only way for young kids to really understand. So what we did was we worked with the gentleman here as an actor but was acting out one story in particular which was Robert McConnell's story. And it was the story of him from boy to man and what he'd gone through. There was a script written which was presented in nine primary schools in the classrooms. So kids sitting on the floor, Robert and Edith, who was the representative of the only female teacher at the school at the time, um, was there. And what Robert did, 12 minute script, he started in his school uniform with his wee cap, playing in the playground, and it slowly moved through him changing into his uniform and going to war. And then the kids were asked to do what's called tableau performance, where they had to freeze frame in certain positions and think about being on the trenches and being on the football pitch and all these different scenarios. And by the end of it, then they were all doing drills and pretending to be soldiers. And one we, I mean, there's a couple of pictures of a couple of boys' faces who were just the emotion you could see it had hit them. They realised what this was about. It was about a little boy who'd grown up and gone to war and hadn't come back. So in terms of drama, it was one of the first times we've done that as a school. I know Living Legacies do it more now, but it was a very powerful piece of work. All the pupils were then asked to write postcards back from the front and all sorts of activities that kept it going. So we had about 400 pupils across Belfast involved in this. And then we decided we'd bring them back up to the college. We did it out in the schools. So we thought, let's bring them back up to Central Hall and let them see all the pictures in situ. So we brought all 400 up. And it was mayhem, apart from anything, it was crazy, but it was, just, it was just really fantastic to see how they got it and they understood. So again, that was part of our drive. It's not just about the photographs, which is a very important part and what Joy has done is very interesting and fascinating, you'll hear about that in a moment, but it is about us reaching as many people as possible. So those are just some examples. These are the drills on the top right. I wish we could get our kids to do that every day, to line up <laughs> in lines would be fantastic. Um, but as I say, it was very, very special to see how they all reacted. We are looking with the primary schools project of running a teacher training to train other primary teachers to then carry on and do this themselves. Secondary schools, and I'm going to try and jump to the website again, but I think I've lost the technology person, so I might not be able to do that. Secondary schools is more challenging. How do you get 15, 16 year old boys to engage in things? Um, so different ideas that we did. First of all, we wanted it to reach into as many different subject areas as possible. Should I get that? Um, yes, it's just the video of the German teaching one. Um, so what we did for secondary schools, we had a <laughs> one week intensive write a poem and deliver it for the Side Arts Festival, which was for A-level students. Um, it was a workshop where they arrived on a Monday and by Friday they had to perform in front of a live audience quite stressful and when I came up with the idea I thought it was brilliant until I sat on the Monday with five students looking at me going, what? <laughs> you want me to do what? But I have to say, so we worked with Bloomfield and Strathairn and they were phenomenal and I think it's lovely when you, I have a 16 year old son so it's amazing when you see 16 year olds and what they're capable of doing if you just give them a challenge. So the five of them put together a poetry slam event uh, where they had poems that were linked to the war and linked to their own personal development and it's phenomenal. That was with these side arts. Um, the other thing then we did 
with our senior school. We trained our history boys, we got them on the Belfast City Bus Tours, and we brought Belfast City Bus Tours in to train them to be tour guides. So they got trained up to know the history of their schools and run tours for people, um, which again was a fascinating experience. We also decided, well, we felt it was important from a perspective point of view to look at this from the German perspective as well as from our side too. So we worked closely with the school in Berlin um, and asked them to do the same project. It was a storytelling project where they had a number of soldiers, we had a number of soldiers and we had to write stories about those soldiers' lives and then translate them into German and they had to translate them into English and then do a FaceTime presentation. Again, great ideas. I came up with the ideas and the teachers looked at me and said, I'm crazy, but we did it. Uh, and I have to say, I'm going to try and show you a wee video about that project, the German project. It's just so different um, and a really interesting example. So, just walk amongst yourselves while I try and work technology. So this is the website, so you'll see all the stories are on here of everything that we did. Um, <coughs> German language, okay. So these are all the students that have been involved in the project. Um, and then this is a little film. We've also then created a, a sort of tips on how to story tell as well, which is sent to all the other schools around Northern Ireland. So hopefully this will work. The Men Behind the Glass project is a research program which looks at the 126 uh, men and one teacher who died in the Great War and who were former pupils of Campbell College. And the aim is to restore photographs of them in Central Hall, where we're standing, but also to do research into their quotes real life, so we get beyond just their military service and them as photographs of them all, but we, we learn about them as individuals and people. Every group picked one of the young men, and they had some facts about the young men, about their lives, about their service, and also about how they died, and they used those to try and breathe new life into them, and to, to bring them alive and keep their memory alive for another generation. There was a really good bus working with Sheena. She was very engaging. She engaged the pupils. She talked about her own experience. And it was very, very pleasing to see how the pupils then took this into work. And with the results, it was very, very pleasing to see what they came out with. It was a total surprise for me to see how they were able to put everything into action and they could compose such a very impressive piece of work. There was something very moving about hearing the experiences of young Irish men translated into German because of course their experiences would have been so similar to those of the young German men against who they were fighting. So I think this really was a project that transcended borders. Germany lost 1.7 million people in the First World War four to five million wounded and even much higher casualties than, than suffered in Britain. And so we have to think that, you know, while we remember here, we must also remember that this is paralleled in Germany. Ja, hallo, äh, liebe Schüler in Berlin. Ähm, wir haben also sehr viel Spaß gehabt bei dem Projekt ähm, Men Behind the Glass. Die Schüler haben 
äh, Geschichten geschrieben, sie haben Briefe geschrieben und heute hier äh, präsentiert. Ähm, ich hoffe, dass ihr genauso viel Spaß habt und dass ihr dieses Projekt genauso ähm, wirkungsvoll findet, wie wir das fanden und wir wünschen euch natürlich viel Glück dabei. Viele Grüße aus Belfast. I probably should have had subtitles unless the German speakers, I don't, not quite sure what was said there, but teacher reassures me it was all fine. Um, so I think what was interesting and different about this project, and it, it's, it's been nominated for awards because of it, is that we stretched it into lots of different areas and we tried to look at it from lots of different perspectives. And I think that's what resonated with the pupils, is that whether you were in the English class or the German class or the history class, you got to look at it from, from that perspective. So that, that was the exciting bit to work on uh, for the project as well. A little bit about community engagement, then I'm going to hand over to, to Joy to talk about the actual the process of the photographs, which is fascinating. Um, one of our keys was to reach out beyond the schools, was to the local community. So European Heritage Open Day we do every year at the college. This year we did it differently. We had a, an archive open morning and we basically worked with 15 local organisations, history associations, the Irish Language Association, a real mix of organisations to bring people to the college to look at the project but to bring their own archive material as well and Prony were brilliant to set up a table for you know bring your bit of history and Prony would have a look at it and, and give you some advice on what it was and I don't know if are you happy for me to talk about the bit or am I going to steal your thunder but we had one gentleman came in from was it the Shankill Road, he came over with a piece of paper that he found in his attic, which was the discharge papers uh, for his great grandfather's grandfather, and they'd been signed by C.S. Lewis, and C.S. Lewis was a former pupil at the college, um, but this was just a fantastic and amazing piece of, of history to see, so these are the kind of things people were bringing in that morning, I mean the buses coming up and the history boys doing the bus tours, and it was brilliant, so we must have had over 400 people that day, and usually European Heritage Open Day we have about 20, so it was great, you know, and to me it was a fantastic um, part of the project. That's the paper there that was signed um, by C.S. Lewis, so I think that's the one there. So I think that just sends, um, tingles up your spine really, but um, Obviously Edmund de Wind, very important alumni of ours um, as a VC recipient and the Edmund de Wind Association were marking their own um, commemoration of him so we welcomed them for an event. Um, we also welcomed the de Wind family from Canada and America came back to visit, uh, Josh de Wind, his grandson. Um, so amazing part of us was about bringing families back. Um, Robert McConnell, who was our story for the primary schools, this is his uh, niece's um, samples, so they came back to, to talk about um, Robert McConnell's story and we found a sword of his that had been in the archives that he was presented by his church. Um, so again, we were able to show the family the sword, um, so very special moments there, connecting with families. And then the exhibition, which is really why we're here today, this exhibition is really a culmination of all the bits of the project and it's been on tour, um, it's been uh, all over at the moment and it's here for the next six weeks I think and then it goes to the City Hall and uh, I'm becoming an expert in building exhibitions and taking them down but um, this was part of the legacy of the project to keep just keep spreading the word about the stories of, of these, these men and boys and hopefully you've had a chance to have a look at it. I'll not dwell too long, but the key for us was not just to do this project and then leave and move on to the next. It was about how do we create something that keeps going. So as I say, with the primary schools, we're hoping to set up teacher training events for primary school teachers to use the skill sets that we've developed through the project for their own classes. We've year 10 resource packs that we've developed that um, SIA have now endorsed and we'll be sending those out free access to all schools history departments. Um, German storytelling, we have a video we've produced and we're sharing that with all teachers and the exhibition. So we're looking always at ways in which we can share the learnings that we had from our staff to others. And then the boys themselves as a final piece decided to put on a play about it last year. And this was written by our head of drama who'd never written a play before in her life. I have to say, can't believe what was produced at the end. So. Um, it was basically telling the stories of a number of the boys who we researched during the project and this was our school performance last year, I think a number of you maybe were there. Um, and the most emotional bit at the end was the boys who were involved in the play as they walked down <coughs> off the stage 
took their caps off and paid tribute to the photographs. And that had not been choreographed. The teacher couldn't believe that they each one, there was probably about 60 of them, stopped. That, so um, there wasn't a dry eye in the house, the teachers were <laughs> So um, that's me. But all in all, you know, I'm sorry I can't talk more about the actual history. That would be Dr. Uh, Tom Thorpe's specialty. But as a project for us, it was born out of just the need to fix the photographs. Um, we feel it was, it's been a really important part of our college uh, culture over the last two years. I'm really grateful to Peroni for being on that journey with us. Um, and I think the story of the photographs that you're about to hear from Joy is fascinating and uh, one that we really enjoyed hearing. So thank you for your time. Thank you. Um, Everybody. Um, I'm Joy Carey and I'm responsible for the digitisation work that goes on in Pronin. So as uh, Cathy said, we worked together in partnership with Campbell to produce this project. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about it from the Pronin perspective. Um, so in, back in 2017, the photographs were taken down off the wall by Campbell staff. Uh, we were asked to go and see them before they were removed from their, their, um, their wooden panelling that they were in. Um, we first of all thought that they were original uh, albumin prints that we thought dated from around 1914 and would have been taken of these individuals before they went off to war, obviously. Um, but as I'm going to tell the story, you'll see that, that uh, we had to rethink that, that whole thought process. So the first thing that we did was to, when the pictures were taken down off the wall in Campbell, then they were brought here into Pony. Uh, we have got the right storage environment, we adhere to the right um, environmental conditions, the, the, um, they're kept in the darkness, they're also kept in a non-humid environment and uh, also the temperatures are all to British standards for archives. So it means that the pictures themselves, the photographs, hopefully won't degrade or we are at least slowing that process um, in, probably in the storage environment that we have. All 127 of the, of the portraits were then accessioned by Prony, and accessioning is really a formal uh, way that we talk about receiving, signing for and accounting for everything that's deposited with us. Um, then they were given the catalogue reference number. You can see here there's a little um, screenshot from our catalogue. Every different collection of Prony is given a unique reference number and that's how we know what belongs to what collection. And then every item within that collection is designated its own number as well. So every individual photograph from the men behind the glass, every 127 of them, was given its own unique reference number. <coughs> the next thing that happened was um, <coughs> all the portraits were brought up to the conservation studio, which is on the second floor in Prony. And if any of you get the opportunity to come to our behind the scenes tours, you'd be more than welcome. And it's always very interesting to see what goes on in the conservation studio. We had to remove the images from the mounts. Now the mounts were adhered, um, stuck on to the original photographs. The original glue had become extremely brittle and it was the conservator's decision to remove that with a scalpel. Sometimes they would use liquid or water or some kind of uh, liquid to dissolve adhesives like that to remove things but the decision was taken that it was so brittle, the easiest way was with a scalpel and that was going to do the least damage to the photographs themselves. Now the reason we decided to remove them from these mounts, the mounts themselves were very acidic. The paper that they're made of um, has got, um, it, when it, when it um, attracts with the humidity in the air, it'll form sulfuric, sulfuric acid which will eat into the paper itself and can damage the photographs. So we decided to take the mounts off them completely. <coughs> Um, you can also see that many of them have been water damaged. The one on the, on the left hand side here particularly has got a lot of staining at the bottom. And Cathy's mentioned that there's been leaks and things that have, have occurred in the Great Hall and the Central Hall in, in Campbell. So, and also just the, the heat and the light and the environment that they were uh, susceptible to has caused them to um, deteriorate in the way they have. They're also very dirty. Um, the decision was taken by Campbell to commission new standardised mounts and it was lovely for me to see those images because I haven't been back to see them 
in, in Central Hall since then. So to be able to see just all those those new um, mounts and how just how smart they're looking today is great. Um, it was necessary to remove the mounts also so that we could digitise the full photographic image because you can see some of them are different shapes and sizes. And for example, the one on the right hand side there is in an oval shaped aperture. And when we remove that, there's often other details that you can see that have been hidden behind with the mount. Now, as Rose Kelly, Rose Kelly is our archive conservator at Prony, and as she was removing the mount, um, there was a bit of information that passed from her to me. And then I phoned Kathy about it, and we were a bit kind of shocked and surprised at the time, but yeah. it's understandable now. But I'll just read this to you so that you, you get the, the idea. So she'd started removing the, the mounts, and she'd removed two boxes full of the items from their mounts. She's noticed that the majority, if not all of them so far, appear to be printed copies rather than the original photographs. Are the originals still with Campbell, or are they with the donors? I suspect the originals may have been different sizes, so they may have been, these are different photographic processes, albumin, collodion, or gelatin prints. The originals may have been copied at some point to produce the prints, which are all of similar size and are pasted onto card. So what we discovered was that there were photo postcards, which were a way of copying from an original um, back in the 1920s. So Rose is asking, have we any idea where the original photographs could be? So we phoned Campbell, do you know where the original photographs are? And you know, the, the hunt was on, a bit of detective work had to be done as to why um, these were copies that were on the wall. At which point I fell off my chair when I heard the word, these aren't originals, and I thought, oh, are they After like being 1970s copies or something? Yeah, um, with the HLF funding yeah, and everything yeah. in place. But it was interesting then to hear the, the rest of the story. Yeah, so further investigation was required. So the next step was to digitise the photographs. Um, in our digitisation studio on the second floor, next to conservation, we have uh, some very powerful phase one cameras for any photographers in the audience, and they've got Schneider lenses. Basically, the bottom line is we purchase the best equipment that we can afford because we want to create the best image that we can, first off. Um, there's a train of thought in digitisation amongst archives that we should scan one or scan or shoot once for all purposes, so it's called the SOAP principle. So uh, that's what we try and do. It just means that the archive document itself isn't going to be handled time and time again. Um, we take a really good master copy of something and that means that people can look at that instead of looking at the original. So our cameras are mounted on a motorised column above the item. There's no um, physical contact between the equipment and the item, again for preservation reasons, we don't want to damage them. Uh, the the motorised column allows the camera operator to move the lens and the camera up and down so you get the right focal depth. Also the lighting that we use is high frequency cold fluorescent lighting, um, fitted with diffusers and shutters so we're protecting any fragile documents. Light damage is something very important with um, digitisation and we really have gone against the whole um, photographing anything with photocopiers anymore. There's a lot of light and heat produced from photocopiers and um, we've discovered um, it's well known that light damage to archives is irre irreversible and it's accumulative so the more light that, that it gets the more it becomes damaged and you just can't reverse that at all. So after all the photographs were shot then they're all quality assured. We have to make sure that we first of all we haven't left anything out, we haven't missed someone. Um, there are day focusing issues and that there isn't any over or under exposure and all those sorts of issues so we have to check everything very carefully. We also add uh, descriptive information to our images so we can find them again in the future. So we discovered at the photography stage that there's a variety of different photographic processes evident in this collection. So I'm just now going to talk you through a few of these different processes. So this is Thomas Phillips and he is captain or was captain of the Royal Army Medical Corps. We think from the dress, you see, because this uniform predates World War I, that he is actually, this picture was taken when he became a captain, when he was serving in India from 1909 to 1914. So we think this photograph was probably taken to mark the event when he became a captain. Now this is an albumin um, picture. It's a print. Album printing was the first commercially available method of producing a photograph on a paper base from a negative. So the process dates from about the 1840s, so very close to the beginning of photography, 
and it was a dominant form of photographic positives from 1855 right up to the 20th century. Albumin, you might have heard that term before, it's actually the term for egg white and that's because that's what they used to bind the chemicals, uh, photographic um, chemicals in the, the photograph to the, back, to the backing paper. So it is, and that's why things, you like the people like this nice sepia kind of toned photographs, but that's actually just the egg white that is discoloured through time. So originally that would have been much more black and white, and if you look at some of the ones that we put out in the exhibition area on um, stands on tripods, you can see the old sepia discoloration, and then you can see how the albumin would have actually looked to begin with, and that decision was taken by Campbell to um, reproduce the photographs as they would have been originally, rather than how they have aged through time. The second example here, this was a nice one when we removed the mount, we noticed that it was actually a photograph that somebody had taken of a photograph after they pinned it up onto a wooden surface. You can see here on the top left hand corner there's a drawing pin visible in the image, which you wouldn't have seen behind the mount. Um, this is Sidney Todd Martin and he was a lieutenant in the Royal Inniskilling Fusiliers and he died age 25, a month before he was going to turn 26. The original may have been an albumin print again, or a gelatin silver print, and that's a process that came just straight after albumin, and it's been used right up to colour photography coming in the 1960s. Now, I like this example. This is Alfred Kyle, Corporal of the South African Infantry, who died age 24. Um, <coughs> You can tell from the posture of the subject that this isn't a formal portrait. Uh, you can also see from the shadows on his uniform that it's taken outside. There's a, a light source has come from the top left hand corner creating shadows across his, his uniform there. Then when you look carefully you can see the little um, zoom close up that we've got there. You can tell that there's very sharp edges to the, to the edges of his body. He has actually been cut out of his original landscape and he's been stuck onto a plain background <laughs> and then someone is nicely shaded behind his feet to make it look like uh, yeah, that he's naturally in that, in that um, environment. Now this example, this is the guy he was in twice. So we thought we were 127 men behind the glass and then we found there was actually 126. This is William James Porter who's a lieutenant in the Leinster Regiment of the Royal Canadians. We weren't sure why he appears twice at all, and I think it's probably just an administrative error that they didn't realise they'd already done this one. Um, it's a good example of postcard printing. The one on the left hand side here is a copy from an original photograph. You can see that with the close up there it's a lot more smoother in tone, it's not grainy, um, it's just a better quality picture. The one on the right is probably a copy of a copy. Now, if you think about if you've ever worked in an office and you've done a lot of photocopying, if you photocopy something several times over, you lose the quality time and time again until something's barely readable. So that's kind of what's <coughs> starting to happen with this if you copy a copy and copy that copy again. Also, um, photo postcards were, were that size and dimension. You can see the one on the right hand side is smaller than the original copy as well. So example five, this is, is an unusual one, this is a half tone reproduction which was a printing technique so we think that the original of this was probably used in a newspaper. You can see on the, the close up there that, that it's made up of lots of tiny dots, it's called half tone reproduction. Um, normal photographs give a continuous tone but this um, it's kind of like an illusion to the eye where you use dots of various sizes and various darknesses to produce an image um, and how large and how close together they are gives the illusion of the picture. So that was an unusual one. This one's just a nice example of a more amateur snap. It's not been done by a professional photographer. It's informal in pose and it's out in the open air. It's probably likely that it was taken by a colleague of Brian Stuart Brown, who this is. Um, could have been when he was on deployment or on leave. He was in the private artist's rifles and that aroused my um, interest, what was, what was that about? So it, I looked into that and a re regiment was formed in the 1850s made up of artists, musicians, actors and architects. 
And, but I think as time went on, it was opened up to other other people to, to join that one as well. Now, this is probably a family photograph. Um, he's not in uniform. He's in civilian dress. He looks very young, taken before the war. It's Charles Hanna, who was Lieutenant Corporal in the 121st Battalion of the Canadian Infantry. And in the last one I'm going to show you here, this is the only, in the whole 127 pictures, the only first generation print in the collection. You can see the colouring of it. It hasn't, um, it hasn't gone that, that kind of sepia orangey tone. That's because this is a is a, sorry, a gelatin silver print, it's not an albumin print. Um, and this is the type of black and white photography came in, came in the industry standard after World War One. And um, it could be that this one was added to the collection just at a later date. Um, so, to sum up, we found a whole variety of various types of photographs, and most of them, apart from one, are copies. So we reckon that what happened was the families were asked to submit a photograph to the college and obviously if you'd just been bereaved of a son um, at that age and in that way you would not want to hand over your photograph, your original copy and never see it again. So they were asked to make copies themselves and they went to their own local um, photography studio or whoever they knew who could create such a thing and that's why there's a whole variety of different types of processes evident in that collection. Um, we also undertook some workshops, a workshop for art and design teachers. We just wanted to explain to them the work that went on in Pruny. A lot of people don't know the kind of things we do up and read the graphics behind the scenes and how that might be relevant to what they were teaching their students in schools. Um, some parts of the art history curriculum do still involve the history of photography, so we just wanted to offer that, um, that opportunity to teachers to come in here and see some actual real life examples of these things rather than just textbooks. And then we did invite, or we had um, some of the, was it fourth year students? Fourth and fifth year, yeah. Fourth and fifth year. <laughs> and this is the news team, and they came in and, and did a little video about what we did with our photographs. And um, they went into the stores and photographed in the stores where the, the photographs are being held now. Um, and up, came up and interviewed myself and Gareth, who's our archive photographer, about what they were doing. So it, it was lovely just to see how people were interacting and interested in the work that we were doing as well. So that's me. If you have any questions, glad to answer them. And thank you for listening to me. Thank you. Good afternoon, folks. Uh, my name is Janet Hancock, and I work in public services in the Public Record Office. Um, and I suppose I'm just going to talk to you a little bit about how Pony worked with Campbell on the other side, so part of the partnership worked around the preservation element and the expertise around preserving the photographs and the digital reproduction and I suppose the other element, I'm going to talk to you a little bit I suppose about about Crony and, and how that, uh, this became a sort of logical partnership. So uh, Crony was established in 1923 and we're the official repository for public records and we hold around three million documents here um, our oldest dating back to uh, the 13th century. Um, so in terms of, of a, an organisation where you find and research information, it was a logical partnership in that regard. Uh, and you've heard Joy talking about our storage. Here's just a little image of our climatically controlled stores uh, here in Prome. Uh, I'm sure some of you have been here to carry out research, but for anybody who hasn't, I'd encourage you to get a visitor pass uh, when you're here, and you can come, probably it's free of charge for everybody to use. Uh, this is an image of our search room. Um, probably not really in the keeping of, of it. if you haven't been here before, it's not necessary everybody's first image of what an, archives, an archive looks like. As you can see, uh, quite a lot of computers, um, our archive is based, we have an electronic catalogue and usually my nearest analogy is it's a bit like Argos. Everything we have is a unique reference number. It has a description which tells you about the record and you can order these original documents. A member of staff will go and retrieve that from the stores and you can really spend as much time as you wish actually consulting some of those original records. 
and really this is the backbone of where our history and where our historiography and where our historians gather and consult uh, and produce uh, the history that we know of today is through looking at archival sources. Uh, we offer workshops uh, to members of the public just to talk about research and getting started and obviously you can come in as an individual but equally you can come in as part of a group and get a bit more of an orientation. So as I said for anybody who hasn't started the research, uh, Stephen mentioned our programme of events with a range of workshops so I'd urge everybody to come and uh, take a look at this wide range of material we have. We have a huge collection uh, of letters, diaries, documents relating to the First World War. Uh, my colleague Ian Montgomery here uh, produced a guide to First World War resources in Prony and compiled a lot of the research I'm going to be talking to you a little bit about now, uh, about one of the uh, former Campbellians. So, uh, And as you can see, we have people of all ages coming to Prony, um, from those researching family history to those researching, these were a group of media students um, who were using actually old um, textile records as inspiration for fashion design, the, the, the students at Belfast met. And obviously we had Campbell students uh, who came along with students from Bloomfield mm -hmm. um, for workshops here to look more at the man behind the glass. Um, and so really this what we wanted to offer as PRONI is to bring in more of that archive research and actually sort of help the students understand, uh, number one, a bit more about how, how you get history, how research actually happens and getting a bit more hands-on with the documents, but equally to look at the men behind the glass more as, uh, as, as sort of some of the younger children's workshops took place, to look at them as people and think about really, these were young people, much the same age as some of them were, not much older, and, and really to sort of think about them in that context. They were somebody's son, they were somebody's brother, they were somebody's niece, nephew, they, they lived locally, they didn't live lo where did they, what was their life like before it was basically interrupted, traumatised and cut short as part of the First World War. Uh, and in this we looked at, you've already heard Edmund De Wind, uh, VC, uh, a medal uh, holder was mentioned, um, distinguished alumni of Campbell, um, and we also have some records relating to Edmund De Wind in the Prony collection. And equally what we discovered uh, was Edmund's sister, uh, Edith De Wind, who actually served as a nurse in the First World War as well. And we used Edmund and Edith uh, to build a student's workshop for uh, year 10 pupils from Wimpy and Campbell to come in and spend some time with us here at Prony and learn more about Edmund and Edith and learn a bit more about research skills. And really an interesting facet to bring in uh, the other people were involved. Many women served in, in both in the front line and on the home front and to look at this in a slightly wider context. So as part of the workshop, um, well actually as part of the workshop, they started looking at contextual information like timelining, what was happening during the war, but equally what was happening here, what was going on at home, what was life like for people who continued to live in Ireland, things like looking at the labour movement, looking at women's history. So they spent a little time just looking at some uh, printed sources and online sources and basically posting a wee timeline so that you could set Edmund and Edith's journey in, in a bit of a contextual timeline. And then, uh, as I said, we, we had lots of source information that they really got a bit hands-on. And you can see some of the information was both uh, online from ourselves, from other archives and things that are held, original records held here in Prony. So for example, this is the transcript of the 1901 census, where you can see Edmund and Edith uh, in their family home at Castle Street in Cumber, County Down. Um, and you can see already you're starting to build up more of that family picture. Uh, lots and lots of online sources. So the Commonwealth War Graves Commission, you'll get some really interesting information on Edmund. Um, military uh, medal roll card indexes and really what we, we actually asked the students to do was compile a profile of Edmund and Edith and use some of, some of these original records um, to try and build up that picture. So 
we find that we find them in the 1901 census, and then we find Edmund um, in the 1911 census. He since moved to Cavan, um, and then we see in 1911 he is also found on a migration record on a steamship on his way to Canada. Um, so actually we find out that, that Edmund's first encounter uh, in the military really, he joins the 31st Battalion of the Canadian Expeditionary Force in Edmonton, Canada in 1914, where he'd moved, actually he'd moved to Canada where he was working for the Canadian Bank of Commerce, uh, and he initially um, joins the Canadian ranks. So in 1915 he embarks for England, uh, and in 19, uh, September 1915 he actually arrives in France, um, before being selected for officer training in 1917, where he's eventually commissioned as a second lieutenant, uh, and he joins the 15th Battalion of the Royal Irish Rifles in France uh, in December 19. So through a wide range of these sources, we're starting to really build up, starting to build up a picture of, of Edmund's life actually, and starting to see him in that regard. Um, and there's his commission, and again, letters from the front, written by Dewind in 1915, just really talking about his experiences, which is, is quite unusual. And as I said, one of Prony's real strengths is uh, the large collection of letters and diaries that Prony holds from people writing from the front and about the front, and two other family members, and even retrospectively to family members of the deceased, where they talk about uh, Interestingly, was what they talk about, and sometimes even more interestingly, what they don't talk about in, in order to, to sort of protect their family back home and spare them from the horrors. And part of this is because they wouldn't have been allowed to, and a bit like the photograph that may have, may have been taken uh, in combat where they wouldn't have been allowed to see the background. Um, and again, moving on to newspaper archive where we were able to see how this story unfolded. Uh, and again, and interesting, um, Edmund was actually killed on the 21st of March 1918 uh, at the race course Redoubt in Grugy. Somebody can correct my pronunciation here. Um, but actually, in April, he still only reported missing. And you can see from letters and correspondence here, probably amongst those taken prisoner, uh, seems to have been the fate of those in this area. He's reported as missing in the Lauren Times in 1918. And actually, it's not until uh, October of that year that he's actually reported as killed in action, uh, and he's posthumously awarded the Victoria Cross in 1919. But it just goes to show, and that would have been probably a familiar experience, that period of not knowing, and the period of correspondence in between with other colleagues. He's probably, he's probably been taken prisoner. He's not, like There was a number of months in between uh, his actual death and the family receiving that confirmation. So again, this was something that we asked the students to sort of consider and think about and the impact that that would have had on family members as well. Um, and we have information that actually tells us a little bit more about, uh, about Edmund's life as well, Do you know, and why he was actually awarded the VC um, for, for most conspicuous bravery and self-sacrifice on the 21st of March. 1918. For seven hours he held uh, this most important post and through tw though twice wounded and practically single-handed he maintained his position under another section until another section could be got to his help. Um, so uh, the amount that you can actually find, uh, that's, that was actually printed in the London Gazette in May 1919. And the Canadians have claimed him as their own because he spent some time in Canada. And actually, you have Mount Dewind uh, in Jasper National Park in Canada. Um, but you can see the, the rich volume of, of archival sources that we have here. Uh, and equally, when we, when we go on to look at Edith, uh, Prony, we don't actually have a huge amount on Edith here in Prony. And which is probably quite symptomatic of the fact that we don't have anywhere near as much which reflects women's voices in history in general, never mind just in the First World War, as we do on male voices. But sometimes uh, there is actually more there than you might think when you actually start to dig around. Uh, so we started as well to look at Edith. 
and we find that uh, we see her in the household in 1901, but we see her in the 1911 census um, where she's recorded as a living, uh, she's recorded in the 1901 as a trained nurse, and by 1911 she's living in London working as a private nurse, well, we assume what's a private nurse in a private household. And when you start to look around online, there's a fabulous resource in the Friends Ambulance uh, Service, and then it starts to unravel uh, that actually Edith spent more time on the front than Edmund did. Uh, she, she worked, she goes to France in November 1914 with the Friends Ambulance Unit. Um, she's a nursing sister in St. Pierre Hospital uh, near Dunkirk. Um, she, she moves on to Matron, and she's matron of three British Red Cross hospitals in Abbeville before leaving the Red Cross in 1916. Uh, and you can see all the lots of bits and pieces of personal detail that is coming up as part of that. And equally, you can see Edith's uh, medal card gives us a bit more information. So really, uh, and there we see Edith in, in later life in a picture from the Northern Wig, and she lived... Well, she was, uh, I'm not sure when she died actually, um, but she was still alive in, 19, in the 1940s. Um, so we asked the students basically to build a profile. Everybody's used to their Facebooking and who's who and who's what. And we split them into groups, work with each other, and we gave them all a little source pack, but they all had slightly different sources and they all had to interrogate their source pack and basically do a profile for Edmund and Edith and, and really look at who their family were, you know, where they were born, they had to answer things like who were the father's name, where was their place of birth, and the source material threw up idiosyncrasies on that that they really had to sort of think about. Like, for example, we know from birth records that Edith was born in 1868. However, when she joins up, she actually, uh, she, she, tells, she tells them on joining that she was born in 1871. So you find some young men who are lying about their age here much younger uh, so that they can enlist and equally, she's lying about her age to make her a little bit younger so that she would be able to, to sort of enlist. And again, this was one of the things that really struck us and one of the things we asked the young people to really consider was what would what might have motivated them, what would motivate you, knowing what you know and having read what you read. Think about that. Do you know, how badly did they want to go? What was the motivation? Was it service? And they, they looked at some material about the First World War and, and, and the Times, and we got some really, really interesting, um, they got to see some original records as well as part of that, but we got some really, really interesting conversation uh, from the students around that, and we got some really interesting feedback, and really insightful feedback, when they started to really think about how would you have felt, and what would that have been like, and to think about how would that have impacted your family. Imagine if that was you in a few years' time, why would you have done it? So uh, some of the questions that we were being asked were really interesting and just so symptomatic of the fact that we live in a digital generation. Like, so was, it, was there not email? <laughs> Do you know, when you're looking at all of this original correspondence, um, they really struggled with the handwriting, for example, and some of these original <coughs> sources, which just sort of illustrates how far we've moved in terms of the sort of tangible, tangible documentation and really important and as I said we've, we've continued to work with Campbell who really felt there was so much value in students getting hands on the documents to really touch and feel and see the original record as such we've had a number of A-level groups uh, in looking at other elements of history purely with the view to actually understanding the value of original documents and seeing the sort of that tangibility of having an original document with your grandparents' signature on where they have actually written it themselves. So really that was that was our sort of one of our final wrap-ups was was to actually bring the students in and look both at the pictures and look at some other source material and, and try and bring that to life through the original record. So that's that's me.